Today is April 2nd, 2022, which means that for Muslims all around the world, it is the first day of Ramadan. Now, Ramadan, as many of you probably know, is the annual month of fasting, one of the five so-called pillars of Islam alongside the five daily prayers, uh, the zakat, you know, giving to charity, as well as the shahada and the hajj or pilgrimage to Mecca. So every year in the month of Ramadan, Muslims around the world will fast for 30 days, so for the full month of Ramadan. What this means is that Muslims will abstain from food and drink, and yes, that does include water, as well as sexual activity from the break of dawn till sunset every day. Now, this is one of the central practices in Islam. As I said, it's considered one of the so-called five pillars of the Islamic religion, so it's one of the main practices. And the reason for this fast, and there are different, of course, interpretations and, and perspectives on why uh, you fast, but in general you could say that one fasts in order to get closer to God through uh, controlling your base uh, desires and your appetites, and through that you're kind of purifying your soul so that it can more easily, you know, receive uh, blessings from God, you could say. Fasting is about turning away from the body and turning towards God. It's a conscious effort to choose God or the divine before one's own desires and one's own needs in that way. It is to reorient one's consciousness and one's soul away from the body and from the ego and instead focus entirely on God and on the divine. Now, fasting in general is, of course, a very widespread practice across different religions all over the world. It's not something that is unique to Islam. Fasting is one of the most common, I would say, spiritual techniques and practices that have been used across history and in different cultures and different religions. Um, you have, you know, in Christianity, you have the fasting of Great Lent, where you fast also for a bit more than a month, 40 days. You have in Judaism, the fasting of Yom Kippur and various other circumstances when the Jews will fast. Sometimes fasting can last for just a few hours, sometimes it's a few days, weeks, a month, etc. But the general idea remains the same, to abstain from uh, usually food and sometimes drink. But it can also be uh, more specific. So some fasts in Christianity, for example, it's it's common to fast on Fridays. But what this means is that one abstains from eating meat and drinking alcohol. So you will eat vegetarian food or sometimes you will eat fish because in medieval times fish wasn't considered meat. Uh, so that's one example of a more specific fast in that way. We have fasts in Buddhism. Buddhist monks will fast and abstain from eating to help with meditation. We have fasts in Hinduism, in the Baha'i faith, in Taoism. So it's a widespread practice across various different religions. And in Islam, it's given a very prominent role as one of the five pillars of you know, obligatory fasting during the month of Ramadan. And there can be differences in, in ideas behind why uh, one fasts in these different religions, but throughout all of it is the trend of making a point of that there is a, there is a spiritual benefit to abstaining from things that we usually consume and to sort of block off our desires in some way, which, and food and hunger is, of course, one of the main things that we experience every day. It's a very central part of our lives that when we don't eat, we get hungry. And that's a very, that can be a very strong desire. You want to quench that hunger or, or quench that thirst by eating or drinking. And by fasting, you're sort of controlling that. And through that, you're, uh, you know, those who practice fasting will say that that uh, is an opportunity to purify your soul or your, your inner state. Now, you know, fasting is also not unique to religions. Many people fast for health reasons without being connected to a specific religion. But in Islam, the fasting is done essentially in order to purify the soul, to control one's base desires and carnal desires in order to get closer to God. And this is a practice that goes back 
to the very beginnings of Islam, it is said that the Prophet Muhammad and his companions would fast during the month of Ramadan. It is also mentioned in the Quran, for example. So in the second chapter of the Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah, it says that, quote, Ramadan is the month in which the Quran was revealed as a guide for humanity with clear proofs of guidance and the standards to distinguish between right and wrong. So whoever is present this month, let them fast. So this verse of the Quran refers to the idea that the first night when the Prophet Muhammad was given the first revelation from God that became the Quran, the first part of the Quran, is known as the Laylat al-Qadr, the night of power. And this was during the month of Ramadan. And this is one of the main reasons that this is a month um, that has become very sacred uh, to Muslims and in the Islamic faith. Uh, and it's the reason, at least partly the reason why one fast during this month. According to the great scholar, theologian, and mystic Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, when he talks about the fast, he defines it as, quote, the purpose of fasting is the weakening of carnal appetites. And hunger, as I said, is of course one of the most central of these carnal appetites. Um, and one that, you know, if we would just listen to every desire we had and consume uh, every bit of food we felt like eating and, and every piece of candy, and, and, you know, that would just not be good for us, both physically and if you do believe in, in a kind of soul, it probably isn't very good for the soul either. And that's what, what these thinkers are pointing to as well. So in Islam, and especially in Sufism, there is talk of something called the jihad al-nafs, the struggle against the self, or the ego and the ego is the you could say the lower part of oneself so the idea of the the individual self that is separated from everyone else and this is the self that also has desires like it wants to eat it wants to have sex it wants to uh, have power and all these things and this self or this ego can become very uh, powerful it can become very dangerous if it isn't controlled if it isn't um, you know kept in its place so to say and this is especially in, in Sufism there's a great focus on on fighting against this idea of the nafs of the self or the soul and this is precisely the purpose of fasting as well by abstaining from food which is one of those central desires that human beings has that is a uh, something that the ego does not like at all and so by uh, controlling the ego by by not giving the ego what it wants the soul becomes more purified by you know being less ego and more direct contact with god in some way al-ghazali again writes quote it is a victory over iblis or the devil the enemy of god most high for his armies are the carnal appetites and fasting defeats his armies because its true nature is the abandonment of the appetites about this, the messenger said, quote again, Satan flows about inside a person as blood does in the body. Thou must make his passage difficult with hunger. The great Sufi mystic Ibn Arabi also states about hunger more generally in his treatise called Hilayat al-Abdal, quote, Hunger is, in every state and every respect, a means whereby the seeker and the verifier can attain to a more exalted degree for the seeker in terms of spiritual states, for the verifier in terms of mysteries. Hunger has a spiritual state and a station. It is characterized by humility, submission, servility, lack of self-importance, indigence, discretion, tranquil emotions, and an absence of base thoughts. This is the state that the seeker has. So he indicates here that by abstaining from these things, by fasting, by being hungry, both uh, literally and in a more abstract metaphorical sense, we are cultivating other aspects of ourself like lack of self-importance, like humility, and that becomes really important for one's spiritual development and for reaching a state that is more closely in line with, with the divine, with God. And these consequences of fasting, like humility and lack of self-importance, also leads to other positive things, of course, in relation to one's perspective on on one's own position and on others who are less fortunate. So sometimes people will say that the fast of Ramadan is essentially about feeling sympathy with those who are less fortunate, those who are poor and cannot, maybe don't have access to food, for example. And while that isn't necessarily the main reason behind the fast, that's definitely a very important consequence and aspect of the fast. That is, you know, if you don't eat and if you, if you, 
cut off yourself from eating and you become very hungry and, and you experience that kind of that pain and that struggle, you will automatically start to sympathize with those who have to go through that and don't perhaps have the security of being able to break the fast whenever they want. So that's a very natural consequence of something like fasting that one gets a better sometimes perspective on those kinds of aspects of life and and society in the futuhat al makiya or the meccan revelations the great compendium by the mystic ibn arabi he dedicates a full chapter to the practice of fasting and the month of ramadan in particular as one of the aspects of this chapter and there he writes very poetically quote when the gates of the fire are locked it turns back on itself and its heat is multiplied on it and it consumes itself the person fasting is like that with his nature when he fasts the gates of the fire of his nature are shut so what he's saying is that the the fire or the hunger that a person feels is not quenched when one closes the gates to the fire so that it cannot be you know you can't put put water on it to make it go out this means that the hunger or desire will want to have something to to make it go away but it won't get that relief so instead it's going to eat itself up and and sort of consume itself uh, and you know not go away of course but in that way one starts to be able to transcend hunger another phrase by Ibn Arabi in the Futuhat one transcends hunger one transcends one's desires eventually um, so that one reaches a higher spiritual state now important to point out is that there are of course many rules surrounding how uh, the fast should be done when one can break the fast what one is supposed to do it's it's not just about not eating as we will see soon and there are of course exceptions when one doesn't have to fast so sick people will of course have to eat or drink so if, if you're sick you don't have to fast during them if you're pregnant um you a lot of people will will not fast when they're pregnant if people are traveling uh, and and especially back then you talk about you know the middle ages for example traveling meant going you know, walking or riding on a, on a horse or something like that uh, for long distances and for that of course you needed sustenance so in those circumstances you didn't have to fast so there are rules around that and not everyone has to fast uh, if they can't fast for example but but it is expected of every healthy practicing muslim that he or she uh, should fast during this month but of course, as I said, it isn't just about not eating or just being hungry. Um, it is about focusing more, so turning inwards and focusing more on your religious duties, on uh, worshipping God and so on. So for a Muslim uh, during Ramadan, they will not just abstain from eating and drinking and having sex during the day. They will also try to not swear. Of course, these things should always be, you know, a Muslim should always try to, to avoid these things. Uh, but uh, during Ramadan, there's often a conscious effort to be even more uh, careful with your behaviors to not swear, not talk behind people's back, not say things that are inappropriate, you know, just being a good person as much as possible. In the Alchemy of Happiness, Al-Ghazali says, quote, So from this you learn that the fast of whomever limits his fasting to not eating and not drinking is a soulless form. For the spirit, ruh, and true nature of fasting is that one makes oneself like the angels, for whom there is absolutely no carnal appetite. The beasts are dominated by their appetite, and for this reason they are far from the angels. Any person dominated by appetite is also at the level of the beasts. When his appetite is decreased, he has begun to take on a resemblance to the angels. For this reason he approaches them, an approach in attributes, not in station, and the angels are near God Most High. Consequently, he is also near God. When he makes arrangements to attend to supper and gives full aid to what the appetite desires, the appetite grows stronger, not weaker, and the spirit of the fasting is not obtained. Al-Ghazari also writes that, quote, It is to restrain all of one's bodily limbs from impropriety, but is not limited to the stomach and the genitals. The perfection of this fasting lies in six things. First, to restrain the eye from looking at things that distract one from God, especially from that thing which arouses one's carnal appetite. He then quotes a hadith that says that the Prophet Muhammad said, quote, Five things break the fast, a lie, slander, table-bearing, a false oath, and a lustful glance. Second, to restrain the tongue from foolish talk and everything that is superfluous. One should remain silent or engage in the recitation of the Quran. Argument and disputatiousness are among the harmful things. As for slander and table-bearing, according to the school of some religious scholars, even the fast of the common folk is broken by them. 
So while the abstaining from food and drink is the outer most clearly visible and main part of the fast, it is also about abstaining from lying, from swearing, from all these other aspects of, of one's life. And instead that one focuses on being a good person and on your religious life. So Muslims will often recite the Quran or read the Quran even more so than otherwise and, and do prayers, both the obligatory prayers, of course, but also additional prayers and really spend the month focusing more than otherwise on religion, on God and on spiritual development, essentially. Fasting is, you could say, a form of jihad, a form of struggle in the religion, a struggle to control your ego, to control your carnal appetites and to uh, cultivate a more pure soul that uh, is closer to God. And, and as I said, also uh, another important result of fasting is, as Ibn Arabi pointed out, things like f feeling of humility, of lack of self-importance, and that also leads to feeling sympathy for the poor uh, and, and other people who are less fortunate. So there's a lot of things that go in to something like fasting and in particular in Islam in the month of Ramadan. And so for this reason, it's a very sacred and special month to Muslims. Um, it lasts, as I said, for about 30 days. It is determined by the sighting of the moon because Islam follows a moon calendar that's different from our Gregorian calendar. Uh, and the Islamic year, because it follows a moon calendar, is of course shorter than the Gregorian calendar that is the sort of standard around the world, you could say. And so Ramadan moves every year. So it moves back about, about two weeks, so about 14 days or so uh, every year. And so some years it will be in the middle of winter, which means that for people in, up here in, in, in the north, in places like Sweden, the hours when the sun is up is very few. Likewise, a few years later, it will be in the middle of summer, which means, again, here in the north, it will be basically no time when the sun has set. So that creates problems, and people solve this in different ways. Some will follow the, the sunrise and sunset of Mecca or other places. Uh, and in, in, in a general sense, there are different ways of solving this. But so uh, it is determined by the signing of the moon, both when the month begins and when the month ends. So the beginning and, and end of the month of Ramadan can, it, it's a bit up in the air exactly when it's supposed to end, for example, until the so-called moon siders can confirm that the month has ended. And by the end of the month of Ramadan, there is the, this great feast called Eid al-Fitr, which is the the greatest, you could say, holiday of the year in Islam, at least one of the greatest holidays, where one will often gather as a family. Children will get presents and families will eat together, uh, celebrating that, well, not celebrating that the month is over, but celebrating um, this beautiful month of fasting and coming together in, in a celebration. So uh, it's a really beautiful tradition i would say it's a very central part of the islamic religion and one that is very important and very dear to a lot of people around the world as i said in the beginning today is april 2nd 2022 which is the official starting date for the month of ramadan for at least most muslims around the world so keep in mind if you know Muslims, you have Muslim friends or family, uh, maybe at your workplace, for example, that for the next couple of weeks, they might be extra tired because they are fasting. But now perhaps you know a little more about what this month is about, what this fast is about. And, and so you can maybe appreciate its long history and the reasons behind this fasting. To all of my Muslim friends out there who are fasting, I wish you a very happy and especially meaningful Ramadan. I hope this month of fasting is spiritually uplifting and I wish you and your family good health. I hope this will be a very meaningful and significant month for all of you who are observing. Thank you all for watching this short and somewhat unusual video on this channel. Uh, but because this was the start of this month, I wanted to do a little video uh, that talked about this significant part of one of the largest religions in the world. I will see you in the next video with some very exciting topics that we'll be talking about next week. So very much look forward to that. For now, thank you so much and take care.